15 years ago, I was co-teaching a women's Bible study in a different church, and uh, we was, I would swap off with another teacher every other week, and we were doing a series on nameless people of the Bible, and um, about two or three lessons into that, the other girl who was teaching, she said, I don't like them, they don't have names, <laughs> <laughs> and so she went about, and so she came up with the names for uh, the, the one she was teaching, which was the woman at the well. And she says, I just like being able to call her by name. And so I always think about the woman at the well by the name of Brooke. And so we came up with these names that match something in the story. So, you know, water, well, Brooke is a stream. You know. So that's kind of how it went. So I thought it was super fun. And so I picked up on it. And as we went through the series, we came up with names for these, these different people all the way through it. So for fun tonight we're going to give people names because we're going to meet th uh three people um there's three stories four people in this um in in chapter um five of mark and i'm going to get they're not by they're not in the bible this is me so <laughs> but i think it's kind of fun so um i'm going to do that tonight and as we go through there um you can you can kind of hang on to them if they do so the first night um, and for the first story we're going to read is in verses 1 to 20, and we're going to call him Diablo, because he is the man who is possessed by demons, right? And Diablo is the Spanish word for devil, so we're going to call him Diablo. Then we're going to meet in the middle and the end of it, we're going to meet Darius, and he has a name, so we're going to have to come up with for him. But if you want to think about his daughter, she does not have a name, so we're going to call her Olivia. See, she was dead and now she lives, so Olivia. <laughs> and then the last one, we're gonna call her Scarlet. That's the woman with the issue of blood, Scarlet. <laughs> so um, 
Blood is red, scarlet, so you see how that goes, right? So these might look like random stories of just more miracles of Jesus like we've seen all the way through up to chapter 5 now. Uh, but these, uh, they have a commonality. But um, these all, these three stories are people who had impossible situations. And so if Diablo, the demon-possessed man, had been uh, here a lot today, they'd have sent him off to a mental institution. If uh, Jairus would have had to take Olivia to uh, the cemetery, and Scarlett would have been in a long-term um, terminal ward care uh, facility. And so that's, but that's not what happened to any of them when they met Jesus. So I'm going to go through these stories, and then I want to come back at the end and pull it all together and see what we learn from these about that. So let's learn about Diablo first. And if you'll remember that where we picked up, left off last time is that uh, Jesus' disciples have come across the, uh, the lake there and there was the storm and he was asleep in the back of the boat, if you remember, and um, he stands up and uh, calms the wind and the waves. So they finish going across and they get to the edge uh, uh, and they get out of the boat when they arrive there. And so, um, they, uh, Diablo meets them, and he's a scary guy. Uh, he lives in the tombs. He's possessed by, uh, by evil spirits, which make him super strong. That's what verse 4 says there. He'd often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And so he's, then he, verse 5 tells us that he lives out there. And he would cry out and cut himself in stone. So he's likely so tortured by these demons that he's trying to kill himself here. And Matthew chapter 8 tells the same story here. That there's such volatility and violence in this man that he made everybody in the community nervous and on edge. And they had to go different ways and travel a different way so they didn't run into him. And um, so now think about how scary that would be. Say you live in a, in a neighborhood and um, there's a... There's a cemetery somewhere nearby, and so you pull up and go out of your subdivision, you stop at the stop sign, and here comes a naked, screaming, bloody guy screaming at you. This is going to put you on edge, right? <laughs> and you're in a car, but so that's what was going on here um, because Luke tells us that he ran around naked all the time. And so what happens is, is that Jesus shows up, and Diablo sees him, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. And so this madman comes at Jesus and his disciples, but instead of attacking them, uh, uh, he falls on his knees. And that's an important point we'll come back to in a minute. But he, so then they shout at the top of their voice and says, what do you want to do with me, Jesus, the son of the most high God? God, notice how the, the demons address him. Perfectly, right? Exactly who he is. We're all the way back to, uh, to verse 1 of chapter 1. That's what Mark wants us to see in the whole of the gospel is that Jesus is the Son of God. And here these demons know exactly who he is. Um, now, he's not, Jesus is not a resident of this community, but they know. They know who he is. And um, after this acknowledgement, they basically give Jesus a little pushback here and say, Swear to God you won't torture us, ironically. What's he been doing to Diablo, but torturing him and the whole community in which he lives? And Matthew, uh, Matthew's version and Luke's version gives us a little more information. It says, the demons say, not just have you come to torture us, but have you come to torture us before the appointed time? Luke says, they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. And that's kind of interesting that the demons know that there's an appointed time for judgment and that their ultimate destination is in the abyss. And so Jesus addresses them. He says, what's your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. So Legion is a military term for the largest Roman fighting unit. And that was about five to 6,000 soldiers. And so that's real crowded in there. <laughs> and um, so you, you might know the rest of the story here. I won't read this whole thing just for sake of time, but there's a herd of uh, pigs out there grazing, 2,000 of them. And so the demons ask Jesus if they'll just, can they go into the pigs? And he grants them permission to do that. And they were about 2,000 in number and rushed down the steep bank and into the lake where they were drowned. And then 
As you can imagine, this causes a lot of commotion in the area of the pig owners and the people in the community there. And so they came to see now what happens. And first they're startled by, okay, there's a lake with 2,000 pig carcasses in it now. What are we going to do with that? And they've lost the money from the pigs and all of that. And so there's this form. And then they see Diablo, this formerly crazy man, sitting there in his right mind. And so... Then there's a really sad verse here at the end of this story is that people begin to plead with Jesus to leave their region. So instead of being grateful that Jesus has freed Diablo, or, uh, and secondly, freed the town from his oppression, they say, go away. And you would think it'd be like, wow, that was a great miracle. He has power over this man who's strong and who's been, you know, tortured by demons. Hey, hold it right there. Let me go get my wife, my kid, my brother, my sister, my neighbor. Can you help them too? But that's not what happens. They just say, please go. Now, here's the beautiful gift of God at the end of the story here. God's grace to them, which I really like. Uh, so Diablo is free. He's whole. He wants to go with Jesus. He's saying, please, can I go with you? But Jesus said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. So he has compassion on the city that basically said, we don't want anything to do with you. So mm -hmm. instead of saying, uh, you know, forget you guys. Um, you don't want to know who I am and you want me to leave. I just, you're let, I'm just going to leave you. What he does is he leaves behind the most powerful evidence of who he is and the authority he has. That's Diablo. And he says, stay here. And I love that, right? I mean, what a testimony this guy is, right? I mean, after the whole pig thing is resolved, I'm sure he, he's saying, look, y'all knew who I was. Y'all knew what I did. Now... I'm just a changed man. Jesus freed me, you know? He can free you too. And so um, and the, as a result of Diablo's presence and influence in this community is that all the people were amazed. This is the story of Diablo. Then we're going to have the intertwined stories of Jairus and Scarlet. And that starts in verse 21. And so uh, this uh, says that Jairus, so they leave the place where they've been uh, on the other side of the lake. They sail back across, and when they arrive back on the other side, there's a big crowd gathered waiting for him to come back. And one of the people there who came to see Jesus was Jairus, which is what it says in verse 22 there. And you see that he fell at his feet. So now we know from where we've been so far in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is at odds with the Jewish leaders, right? The Pharisees, they're already conspiring with their arch enemies, the Herodians, um, to kill Jesus. And the teachers of the law, the scribes, are saying that Jesus is in, uh, in, in conjunction or working with the devil to do what he's doing. So there's a lot of animosity that's already around between the Jewish leaders. Jairus is a Jewish leader. But he doesn't care about what's going on here. He is in a desperate situation with his daughter who is on the verge of death. And so he doesn't care about what it costs him religiously or politically or socially. He comes running up to Jesus in this huge crowd, not, not off the side. He doesn't pull him off into a room or something. He just falls at his feet and um, says, can you help me? He said, pleading earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so she'll be healed and live. And so, uh, you know, the crowd is there. The crowd gets bigger as they hear what J see Jairus. This is very unusual for a Jewish leader to fall down at the feet of this, you know, rebel, um, you know, religious leader here. And so there is more crowd gathers around. Presumably, let's go see what's going to happen here. And so there was no doubt an urgent pace that Jairus is like, oh, if you'll come with me, let's go, hurry, let's go, let's go. And, you know, people are getting in the way, they're all crowded around. And in this panic moment, then we meet Scarlet, who is the woman, you know, who's subject to bleeding for 12 years. And it's verse 26 says she suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. And instead of getting better, she grew worse. So at least on the surface, she's got a physical problem, but this condition has permeated every aspect of her life. Now, remember the society she lives in, you know, with a disease like this, the religious system has declared her unclean. So she's on the level of a leper, like we talked about a few weeks ago. 
and so she's ostracized by her family. She, um, she has no friends, the entire community. She can't go into the synagogue. She can't uh, do anything with the temple. And because it's such a small, close-knit town, you can better bet everybody knew what was going on with her. And so Mark 26 said, just like we read a second ago, is that, that she suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. And I think it's safe to say that that suffering was not just physically, right? I mean, have you ever been to the doctor and come away more exasperated than you went in? <laughs> I, mean, I was at a doctor's office not too long ago and um, trying to figure out what was going on. And I was describing my symptoms and this, that's going on. And she looked at me and she went, wow, that's weird. <laughs> I'm like, that's weird? That's all you've got? <laughs> that's weird? I mean, so I get it, you know. It's the, um, so this condition has engulfed Scarlett at every level, and uh, emotionally, mentally, financially, socially, spiritually. And so when she hears about Jesus, she comes up behind him and says, if I just get near him, if I just can touch him, I'm going to be healed. Now, remember, huge crowd around Jesus. Uh, he's in the company of Jairus, remember, synagogue leader, prominent figure there. And so this is a dangerous plan that she comes up with. Um, is born out of her desperation, and there are huge risks here for her because Jesus is a well-known rabbi, and if she touches him, it makes him unclean. And, you know, she's in this crowd that she's not supposed to be in anyway, and she edges up along. Maybe she's cloaked. Um, so nobody recognizes her, but she's driven by this desperation, and she moves forward and touches, Luke tells us, the, the fringe of his cloak, which was likely the, the outer garment that a religious leader would wear that has tassels along the bottom. So she's just crawling up really close to him to just to touch that fringe on the bottom. And um, then when she does, immediately her bleeding stops, and she feels in her body that she's free from suffering, and so she knows what happened, and I'm, her plan was likely, I'm just gonna touch him, then I'm gonna disappear in the crowd, you know, I'm gonna get my healing, and I'm gonna go on, but then Jesus does think this fearful thing that she wasn't probably counting on, and that he turns around and says, who touched my clothes? Now, she thinks the disciples are gonna, gonna uh, bail her out, because he's like, they're saying, you see people crowding around you, his disciples answered, yet you ask who touched me? Like, they think Jesus is asking a silly question, right? He's like, the answer is, um, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> and so, but Jesus is like, pushes them aside and says, uh, says, you know, who is it? And keeps asking, and he calls her out so she can, he can talk to her. And as our aside for us, this is kind of our inclination too. Usually we come to Jesus, we want just something for myself. I'm looking for just me. And we forget that our encounters can be really important in the lives of other people. That when he does something for us and interacts in our lives, that it is not just for us. He wants us to be bold about our faith, confident in what he's done for us, so that others can hear and be encouraged at the same time, like right here. I mean, we have to remember what else is going on in this story. Je Jesus is with Jairus, who is about to hear that his daughter is dead. And he needs the faith to believe that Jesus is enough for him, too. And so we don't know what's going on in anybody else's life. And, and so a lot of times we go along in our lives and don't think anything else about whatever is going on out there. And we're only thinking about ourselves. But who can our story impact? We need to speak up, we need to speak out, we need to stand out from the crowd and say who Jesus is, say what he's done for us, and, and be bold about it. So back to the story, Jesus says, he keeps looking around, and she's like, okay, I can't get away now. So she comes out, falls at his feet, and trembles with fear, and told him the whole truth. And then there's this wonderful tender moment here where he says, daughter, your faith is healed to you. Go in peace and be freed. From your suffering, but before uh, that can they can really have this any more there. This is d interrupted by uh, the some men came from the house of Jairus and to give him the bad news that his daughter is dead. They say, why bother the teacher anymore? The implication is it's too late. As long as she's alive, maybe Jesus can help. But death is too much. He can't even Jesus can't heal death. That's the idea. 
Okay, he ignores this and he says, tells Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. And this is what we need to hear, need to hear basically all the time too, right? Just believe, not figure out how it will work and then believe, not entertain your fears and try to believe, not do a worst case scenario and then believe what you think is possible, but believe, not believe in a preferred outcome, but just believe. And what are we to believe? Jesus. We're supposed to believe in Jesus. I was listening to a podcast this past summer, and this was a discussion with a, a, par, a, a set of parents who went through a gut-wrenching death of their two-year-old son. He was born with a rare terminal disease, and, um, and the mom sat on the backside of the outcome just you know, through tears, she, and she talked about how she preserved her faith through all of this, and that was the point of the podcast. But what she said was stuck with me. She said, you can hope for an outcome, but if you hope in anything besides Jesus, you will be disappointed. Think about that. You can hope for an outcome. That's fine. That's, you know, bring, your, bring your needs to him. Bring your desires to him. But if you hope in anything besides Jesus, you will be be disappointed and um and so uh, you know yes we can hope for those things we can hope for what we want but we hope only hope in jesus and that is in who he said he was and what he promised to us see now most of the time we read the verses that we love in scripture and we think it's talking about now and, and it does apply but a lot of time most of what jesus is talking about in the Bible is eternal things, spiritual thriving, wholeness, wellness in our souls, not about the answers that we want right here and now. Now, do miraculous things happen on this earth? Absolutely, they do. And there are people sitting in this room who will tell you amazing stories of that, things that God has done, um, it, but not always. Oftentimes, he allows situations to continue and not be resolved the way we want, even when things don't turn them out the way we like them to, we can still have confident hope in Him. Now, remember back to our study last semester in Esther, when we talked about what hope is, just serves as a reminder, mm -hmm. the hope we have as Christians is not centered on what we get or what we will get, but on what we already have. That is a key difference. It's not uh, centered on something out there that, that's going to change for me, but it's based on the historical fact of who Jesus is and what happened on the cross. That's what makes our hope different than the hope of the world. And this is so important to hang on to. And this will keep your faith from being shattered when things don't turn out the way you want them to. Because hope is in Jesus' historical fact for he died on the cross rose from the dead and ascended at, in, into heaven. And when things don't w turn out the way we want them to, we still have confident hope in that because it never changes. So um, I don't know what you've heard about, you know, from whoever's teaching out there that, you know, the gospel pro promises health and wealth and happiness and wholeness and everything you want. That's not the truth. It is not what the Bible says. You know what Jesus did promise to us? In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, not maybe, not might be, not could happen, but in this world, you will have trouble. And so when we have trouble, we need to go, oh yeah, Jesus told me that. No, no surprise, right? But it doesn't stop here. This is not all he said. He said, but take heart, I have overcome the world, and there's where your faith has to rest in who he is, and that's what he promised. So uh, to wrap up this story and see what happens to Olivia, we'll jump right over to the end of it, back to Mark 5, 39. It says that he went in, went, showed up at Jairus' house, went in, and so the mourners had showed up. They're all wailing and crying and starting the whole process of mourning the death of somebody like they did. And he says, why is all this commotion and wailing? The child's not dead, but asleep. And they laugh at him and, and everything. And he sends them out. And then he goes in and speaks to Olivia. And she stands up, walks around. And at this, they were completely 
astonished. And so this uh, wonderful three amazing miracles in this chapter. So what's the takeaway? Well, they all have a commonality. And when I was studying this and I was looking for the connection, I saw two lessons for us. And so first of all, the first one is that all three of these people, all three of these stories come to Jesus and fall at his feet. And so what we learn is that impossible situations find relief at the feet of Jesus. And uh, so uh, if you remember Diablo, back the first story we did had, see he sees Jesus at a distance and he comes and drops to his knees at the, at the, in front of Jesus. Now the word there for dropping on his knees is the word for worship. And I thought this was really interesting. I grappled with this for a long time. Because a lot of the commentators that I read about this verse said that it wasn't real worship because it was the, devil, uh, the demons that were making him go up to Jesus. And um, so, and it was, it was really just the authority that Jesus had that, that the demons were referencing. But the word that's used here in the, in the uh, original language is proskuneo, which is the word for worship, which means adore before. And so the New Testament usage of this word describes real worship, not just acknowledging a, a, a courtesy or a reverence. That's not what that word means. There are words that mean that. And so now the Holy Spirit, he knows what the word means and could have had him choose a different word if that's what it meant here. So instead of kind of brushing it off, we need to grapple with what is actually here. And so as I was Thinking through this and wrestling with this, um, it made no, makes no sense for demons to worship Jesus. We know they don't worship. They know who he is. They don't worship him. It also makes no sense for demons who don't want to interact with Jesus, who say don't torture us, that's the first thing they say, to propel Diablo toward the one who can cast them out. That doesn't make any sense to me. So uh, now I didn't read this anywhere. And if you don't agree, that's fine. <laughs> but what I landed on was is that I think that when Diablo saw Jesus at a distance, that he perhaps exerted every last ounce of physical energy he had to will himself toward the one who could free him. That's what makes sense to me that, you know, because this man is so tortured that he's trying to kill himself, right? <laughs> I mean, the demons know who Jesus is, so maybe they're having a discussion in, inside of his head. Maybe Diablo knows because the demons know, or maybe he's heard rumors or whatever. But I think he's lurching himself forward to force an encounter with, in a last-ditch effort to find relief. That's what it looks like to me. And here at the feet of Jesus, Diablo worships Jesus, and his desperation is obvious to Jesus, which precipitates him casting the demons out. That's the only thing that makes sense to me why the demons would go toward Jesus instead of sending Di Diablo in the opposite direction. So, say so I can see that, Jesus... Uh, uh, Diablo at the feet of Jesus. Then we know we have already said, talked about Jairus. First thing he does is throws himself down at Jesus' feet. Casts aside all decorum. Begs for the life of his daughter. And then Scarlet reaches for the hem of his garment. So she's down at the feet of Jesus as well. And so all three of these people come to Jesus in prostrated submission. They have no recourse except Jesus anymore. Safe to say, all three of them have tried everything that they can do. We have, we know that Jairus is a, uh, a, a prominent man who would have resources. He's no doubt tried doctors and potions and remedies. And, and we know the Bible tells us that Scarlet tried everything. And we know the people in the community, if they weren't trying to find a cure for Diablo, they were trying to away by chaining him up, trying to manage his outbursts. So, now you, for us, usually we do something similar, right? Not if we have a physical problem, not necessarily that, but it can be a spiritual problem or emotional problem or, or something's going on, a habit, an attitude that just hangs on and on, something we can't get a hold of. We try everything we can do to fix it, right? We go round and round and round and round in the tendency, if you have that kind of lean towards somebody who likes to control your situations, I mean, the, the underlying attitude of that is, it's okay, now what do I need to do to fix this? And here we go, we try to figure it out on our own. And so we talk to friends, and we look online, and we watch a YouTube video, we read a book, we go to a seminar, 
And we can even pray about it, right? But prayer can also be a way to try to manage things, right? Have you ever gone to, in prayer with your problem and spend most of the time telling Jesus what to do about it? <laughs> it's like half the time he's like, okay, Jesus, here's the problem. The rest of it is fix it like this. But he doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help. What we need to do is come to him and surrender it. And we need to give it to him. So a lot of times we talk at him, but we don't actually give it to him. And so uh, when there's nothing else, when we've tried everything and there's nothing left, we are wiped out and worn out. Then's when we go, okay, God, if you don't do something, nothing's going to happen. And that's exactly where Jesus wants us, right? That's where we, sh we should start. And the point that we we're willing to stop that self-reliance and give up and fall wholly at the feet of Jesus to do what we can't do for ourselves. And so that's the first lesson is that we need to come to Jesus at his feet in prostrated submission. Another lesson is, and I love this one, is that Jesus always gives more. Jesus always gives more. Look back to the stories again. We got Diablo. He got liberation, right? He was free, whole, in his right mind. Demons were gone. Uh, and then he also got purpose. That was the end of the story there where he became a living testimony to the power and the authority of God. And what he said and did after this encounter with Jesus caught amazement in the lives of everybody else he met. So he got liberation and he got purpose. And then we've got Jairus. He got his daughter Olivia back. But he also got an unshakable faith in the Messiah. Now, remember, he's a part of the religious leaders in the area. And they're all plotting against Jesus. But do you think he ever signed on to those ideas? Do you think you could ever convince Jairus that he was working in the power of the devil or that he needed to be killed? I'm just thinking, no. <laughs> I'm thinking that here's my testimony of my daughter right here, that there's no doubt. He's 100% behind Jesus, knows who he is, and probably was pretty outspoken after he, you know, he says that he wasn't supposed to tell anybody. But he was probably a bold proponent of Jesus, if he, even if he didn't talk about this specific incident. But she's, she was dead. She's raised up. And so there's no way he didn't believe and then lastly, we get Scarlet. She got her healing that she came to him for. But I love this. Just go back to verse 24 again and look at this. He said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your circumstances. Be freed from your suffering. This is the only place in the Gospels where Jesus refers to anybody as daughter. Only place. And now she has been an outcast, completely ostracized by her family, friends. He has no relationships of any value. She's not attached to anybody. She's not connected to anybody. Her disease has just severed all of that stuff. But she, so Scarlet got healing. She also got relationship. And Jesus, by calling her daughter, puts himself into relationship with her. The, uh, and this begins to heal the wounds that are also in her soul, not just in her body. And so her sickness no longer dis defines her anymore. Daughter, that is a tender term of relationship. And if you're a Christian, this is what he calls you to. He calls you daughter. Whatever your past, whatever you've done wrong, no matter how many mistakes, no matter how long, no matter how long you've been away, no how long you have made those mistakes, or how bad they were, those things do not define you anymore. I like to say it. It's not the truest thing about you anymore. But you are defined by your relationship to Jesus. And, you know, sometimes we can read these stories and we think, well, you know, maybe if I just have enough faith and do it right, then, that, then I'm going to get the physical healing that I want. But the truth, that's not the case. That's not what these, this teaches here. And we're, we're going to see next week one of Jesus' most ardent, faithful followers has a, has a heartbreaking story. And it doesn't turn out the way you think it's going to. And so um, it goes really badly for him. Yes, Jesus had the power to change that situation as well. And but this is why submission is such an important piece and part to this. When we choose to submit and follow, even when it doesn't go our way, that's when we can know we're really following Jesus, right? Because if we're just following Jesus, because what it gives to me, who's the most important? 
It's me, right? I'm concerned about me. I'm not concerned about following him. So when we can follow, even in the hard places, even in the difficult situations, that's when we know we're really following him. And we know who he is and we know what his authority is. So even if, even if, whatever happens, whatever how you fill in the even if blank, the answer to that should be, I choose Jesus. That should be what it what it is because you know he never changes even though our circumstances always change uh, he is always present always near always compassionate always caring and even when our hearts break on this earth and our circumstances go bad to worse he never changes Amen. so remember that no matter what the circumstances are whether they work out the way you want to them to or not remember and here's the great part Jesus always gives more and it's always more of himself it's always more of himself he gave scarlet what she never expected that was relationship is your gift too and so the takeaway from this is that when you face an insurmountable problem here's the way we need to do bow low and submit start there come to his feet open your hands on whatever it is whatever you're holding on to that means acknowledging that you don't have the answers. And here, you also need to acknowledge that you aren't the answer, okay? You people who are uh, control people, you're never the answer. <laughs> you are the answer. You need to come to Jesus and find out what his answer is, right? We need to hear that. He is the answer. Always, always, always the answer. So we need to bow low and submit. We need to surrender. And we need to receive. Now, that means stop managing and go to him and listen to what he's saying to you. That means digging into the word. That means dwelling on what he's saying to you and accept what Jesus gives. Surrender means giving up your ability to fix it and to manage it. Remember last week we talked about, or two weeks ago, we talked about going round and round and round the mountain again. You need to give up that. We need to, you know, stop doing the things we've been doing over and over again. And so... Uh, I, I have to tell you, one of the most pivotal things that God ever said to me is, is things aren't going to change, but you can. That's what he said. Things are not going to change, but you can. And that doesn't sound very encouraging, especially when you're wrestling with something, right? That's not what you want to hear. That's not going to change. But what it was ended up being was really this huge pressure relieving word to me that said, you know, I don't have to keep trying to fix this thing. And what it did was it shifted my focus from out here to what was going on to in here, which I have a lot of ability to cooperate with Jesus to change, which is what he's after all, all the time. So this might not ever change, but he is always about working on the inside. And so now I can start cooperating with him to do the work that he wants to do anyway. And so uh, if then, if it resolves, awesome. If it doesn't resolve, I'm closer to Jesus, and that's a win anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so surrender whatever you're trying to hold on to and give it to him and receive whatever it is that he has to offer. And I almost guarantee it's going to be something working on the inside. <laughs> I mean, that's just where he always starts, right? You come to him talking about that over there or those people over there, and he's like, okay, let's talk for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and he's always going to give more, which is more of himself. And the last thing is we wrap up, stand up and live. So Diablo was free, sent to impact others. Scarlet was told to go in peace and then implied live out of that inner peace as well. So things changed out here for her, but it also changed on the inside for her. And we can have deep pain and suffering and, and, and all these things that come into our lives, but we have to remember that this world is not the end. It is not what we live for as Christians. It's, we're just passing through. You know, the promise is what comes after death. And so we need to always have an upward focus. Set your eyes on things above, not earthly things like Colossians 3 says. And realize that you're in Jesus, you're free. In Jesus, you are whole. In Jesus, you are complete. You are overcomer. This is what the Bible promises you. So receive from Jesus. Live in the freedom he has given you and in the relationship with the one who has healed you and made you whole. Amen.
God, we just thank you for the wonderful stories that you have preserved for us of these uh, people who interacted with you. Gosh, we're so grateful for your patience and your kindness and your work in us and uh, your desire to work through us as well. Remind us that whatever we're struggling with, no matter how big or small, finds answers at your feet and in your power. Thank you that you promise to be with us, never forsake us, and empower us to do anything you call us to do. In this Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.